welcome to today's Caregiving Essentials webinar, Shifting Caregiver Identities with Dr. Zachary White. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we reside, McMaster University, and myself, I'm at home today up in Ancaster, we recognize and acknowledge that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. As always, my name is Christine Kennedy, and I'm your host today on behalf of the McMaster Alumni Engagement, Office of Alumni Engagement, and McMaster Continuing Education. I'd like to thank you for joining us. We have a great crowd and a great speaker, so I think you'll be um, quite excited for today's talk. Um, as always, I always want to start off with a little bit of housekeeping. So if you have any questions, if you could put those in the Q&A comments, um, you can see the little icon at the bottom of your page or if you want to share your story or if you just want to make a comment feel free to put that in the chat just a reminder that the chat is open to the public so please don't disclose anything that is uh, too personal of nature or that you wouldn't want someone else uh, reading because not only do dr white and donna read it but everyone else can read it too but we do encourage you to share your thoughts and your experiences because this is one of the wonderful aspects about these webinars is that we share from each other um, I'd also like to inform you of the closed captioning feature. To activate it, please click on more. You see more at the bottom of your screen. Click on that, and then you can click on live transcript. As always, today's webinar is being recorded, so if you need to leave at any point, don't worry. You'll be sent a link uh, probably later in the week or early next week so that you can rewatch the talk at your leisure. So as always, Donna Thompson is here and she's gonna be hosting. Donna is a caregiver, author, and educator. She is the author of two best-selling books on caregiving, including The Unexpected Journey of Caring. Donna also facilitates our free online course for caregivers, Caregiving Essentials, and she is a co-designer and co-instructor of the Family Engagement and Research course, both of which are held at McMaster University. And joining Donna is someone who is very close to Donna's heart. It's Dr. Zachary White. Dr. White earned his PhD in communication from Purdue University and is, and is an associate professor in the James L. Knight School of Communication at Queen's University of Charlotte. Not Queen's University, Ontario. Dr. White is coming to us from South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina. North Carolina. Sorry, North Carolina. What are the Carolinas? Dr. White's research and teaching focuses on helping people manage meaning and communicate challenging life experiences amidst high levels of uncertainty and stress. He is the co-author with Donna on the book, The Unexpected Journey of Caring, The Transformation from Loved One to Caregiver. And we're so excited because Dr. White is joining us. We're going to be giving away 10 copies of their book after the webinar. So we will do that randomly and we will list the 10 winners names in the email, the follow up email with the links that are being discussed today and with the recording, of course. So with all of that information, thank you, Dr. White, for joining us. Donna, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, I am so delighted to be here with you today, Zachary. And uh, I guess, you know, I just wanted to start by going back um, when we first met. And I I'm, I was trying to think of this the other day. I think maybe, was it me that reached out to you first? I think because, so. Yeah, because I had read your blog, The Unprepared Caregiver, which I um, uh, command to everyone who's listening. Your... I was reading what you had written. Um, I believe I had read one of your posts about graduation um, at your university, and you were reflecting on how there's no graduation uh, for caregivers. There's no way of marking the experience, or there's no one to tell you. Um, you know, that officially you're doing a good job or, or anything like that. And I thought, oh gosh, this is so original. Your voice is so original. And then we began chatting and we thought maybe there is a connection between my work and mostly in advocacy and in community development for caregivers and your work in finding 
the language that is required to express very complex experiences. And Zachary, maybe you can tell us just a little bit about more about your work and what you feel passionate about in your teaching. Well, it is a true pleasure, Donna, to be with you. I so enjoy uh, for all of the, those joining us today. I mean, um, Donna is someone I deeply admire in so many ways, and I'm so grateful to have developed a friendship with Donna, which is one of, one of the great uh, outgrowths of our work together. And um, I'm so grateful to, to join today with all the caregivers here joining us who kind of share this common hour, which I know all of them are taking time away from doing many other things to be here. What I, I'm, you know, Donna, like oh, so many of us here, we kind of are thrust into a situation that we didn't expect or anticipate. And I too, 20 plus years ago, was thrust into a caregiving role that I, I clearly didn't anticipate. And and as someone who was getting his PhD in communication uh, from Purdue University, I found myself incapable of communicating what was happening. And I could not. And I thought of all people, I should be the one who was able to understand and help others, um, even my own family members, right? This was perhaps the big, biggest challenge, but then people at work, myself, the stories I was telling myself, the stories that were being kind of handed to me about what was happening and what meanings I should glean from it. I found, I, I found myself remarkably uh, unprepared, hence the unprepared caregiver. I just, you know, it, it had little to do with my lack of medical training. It was more about the sense of why in this culture are we so unprepared for these roles that seem uh, remarkably difficult under the best of circumstances, but there's no support. There's no language, as you were saying. There's no way for us to understand this role transition. Um, I found myself caring for my mother who was who quickly became part of a hospice situation at home and then found ourselves remarkably you know on an island in a world that um prior to that when I was there during Donna my mom's time with chemotherapy the home was buzzing with phone calls and messages from loved ones but also from doctors and the kind of the rhythm of the the progress model in which there's opportunities for treatment or an attempt to uh, manage symptoms. And then the moment that my mother received the death diagnosis, and which I was in the room with the doctor, she and my dad, and there was not one call after that. It seemed to me that the infrastructure of treatment disappeared. And it's not because I think that they were ill will or they were malevolent people or providers. It's just they no longer served a purpose in their minds. And um, you know, the doctor's last words to us was, you know, there's nothing more that that we can do. And I just thought that was we were thrust into a world that made no sense. As that world was closing, Donna, another world was opening up. People who came into our home as part of hospice who walked toward this situation. And then over time, um, involving uh, my work about care and finding you and then being able to open this portal into greater audiences and to greater and deeper understanding, you know, a world of people caring years on end, maybe feeling similarly without a safe harbor, without a language to explain to others and themselves what is happening. And Christine mentioned it in the bio, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm in communication. So many of my colleagues spend a lot of time talking about how to be more efficient, how to, how to help in the organizational setting, how to be more clear. And those are important things, but that's very different than what I do. I'm really interested in what is most difficult to communicate, what is most challenging, but most necessary, and what makes it so difficult, and how can we create barometers and ways to be able to bring language to the experience so that it can shape our realities in ways that, that reflect an authentic perspective rather than what we and I often talk about in the book, this kind of handed to cliches that others think about our situation rather than our situation from our point of view. Yeah. Oh boy, there's so many, there's so much <laughs> in what you said, you know, that touches me very deeply and that I can relate to personally um, so much. And one of the, the things that I found so uh, poignant was when you told me that um, 
when your mother became um, terminal in hospice care, you took the welcome mat at your front door that said welcome on it and you turned it upside down. You didn't want to talk to people. Yeah, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? It sounds like you. I was, we were locking ourselves out from the world and that had been, I had been home at that period, you know, months on end and had seen, you know, visitors coming and, and it, once again, the shift when people believe that there is no hope, that, that somehow there's no reason to go visit you and more, there's going to create awkwardness for them and you, things change. And, and this is something that, you know, um, that we call kind of audience betrayal in our book, Donna, where the people whom are closest to you, so family and dear friends, who you have inevitably the most expectations to be able to support you. Like that is part of someone's, a loved one or a friend is that they will be able to support you in the way that you need and, and, and be able to nuance that in a way that is specific to you. And in one, in one situation in particular, it was someone whom we had great expectations to be able to, they had been, you know, in, in almost like a church-like situation with us. And so we had expectations and uh, I'll never forget hearing in another room, my mother crying and kind of was deep sobs. And, you know, in the course of a day for a caregiver, that's not necessarily out of kind of the ordinary, but afterwards I asked my dad what had transpired. And it, it once again, well-intentioned, but someone who was telling my mother all the things that were ahead of her that were going to be horrendous and, um, and, and that she needed to prepare herself for. And in no way that we were denying the realities of the upcoming dying experience, but the, the oath I made to myself and my mother and my father was good intentions are no longer good enough to get in this door because I felt in my care role at that time that I had to almost play the role of gatekeeper and um, taking on other people's baggage, taking on other people's fears, taking on other people's misperceptions had remarkable ramifications. You know, for, for many of us, maybe recovering from that might be something we could do in the course of days, but um, for someone who was um, more, more vulnerable for a variety of reasons, I felt that that was in part my uh, my responsibility. It wasn't that we didn't allow anyone in. It was just if I felt that someone had to tell us what was coming or tell us something that they felt that they needed to get off their chest, that that really wasn't going to suffice anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I remember another um, workshop that that we did. Zachary, you and I, and we were talking about this role, one of the roles of gatekeeper that <clears throat> we have keeping who is allowed in, who is not allowed in. And I think we used a slide of a drawbridge <laughs> to protect the sacred space of home when someone is, is very ill. Zachary, you wrote such a beautiful letter in our book um, and it's a letter to yourself that expresses many of these deeply ambivalent, complicated feelings that so often we don't have language for. Um, and I wonder if you could read that letter, because uh, I think it's going to really help people um, find the language that they can use for themselves to explain their feelings to their loved ones, too. Okay, Donna, sure. I, um, if anyone has her book, it's on page 35. And it is a letter that um, that I never sent, but it, but it, it is one in which I think um, we wanted to include in the book to highlight how we may feel. And one way to think about explaining what we're going through in ways that when you're in the midst of an incommunicable experience. So I'll just read one page of it and, and then stop there. But I've told you what is happening, but what you don't know is what is happening to me. I'm not even sure what is happening to me. I'm trying to make sense of it all, taking it in and trying to find the words that will be understandable. Coherence takes time. It's not something I can do myself, so I will need you. Right now, I'm thinking through how what I'm experiencing might sound like to you if I tried to explain it. I desperately want you to understand, but I also don't want to scare you. Please don't interpret my silence as a lack of care. I care about you. I care about you and that's why I'm trying so hard. Even though the harder I try to put my experiences into words, the more jumbled it all seems. What I'm trying, what I'm seeing and experiencing and feeling 
It's so raw and all over the place that it will take me time to translate it in a way that I can share. Please be patient with me, please. I'm sorry we're drifting apart. I really am. I'm not picking up my phone or answering my messages these days. Half the time, I feel like I'm too busy. The other half of the time, I see, what you've, I see that you've called, but I don't have the energy to even listen to a voicemail message. It's not that I don't want to. It's just that I feel like I can't right now. I'm here, but I may not even answer the door if you come by. It's not that I don't want to. You want to help, and for that, I am deeply grateful. But being near illness is changing me. I want to be called. I want you to text. I want you to come by, even though when you do, I may not answer. I'm avoiding not just you right now. It's everyone. Please don't take it personally. I get anxious these days. Not about the big stuff. I see that up close and personal all the time. It's the little stuff that's tripping me up. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I get nervous when someone asks me something as simple as, how are you doing? Yesterday, a stranger asked me the, that question as I was waiting in line at the pharmacy. It was as if I couldn't speak. I don't know how to answer that question without tearing up and feeling like I'm tearing apart. I wish I could give you a clean and neat response when you ask me how I'm doing, but nothing right now is clean and neat because I care about you. I can't simply allow myself to say, I'm okay and I'm doing fine. I'm not there yet right now. And right now it feels like I'll never be there. So I'm sparing you and me the pain of lying. And it goes on and on a little bit, but the attempt there to help legitimate in some ways what us as caregivers might feel as people reach out to help us, Donna, but we may not even be in the capacity to be helped in certain moments. So it's that paradox of, of so many different dimensions that we talk about across the caregiving experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you talk in our book, um, and I've put the name of our book in the chat, and maybe Jen or Christine can add the link again. It, our book is called the the unexpected journey of caring, the transformation of loved one to caregiver. And as we wrote this book, Zachary, you and I, we, we had so many conversations about the nature of the transformation that people go through. You've described it on a personal level so beautifully in the letter. Um, and it's a period of, I think, you know, um, part of that transformation is this extreme confusion. And as we talked about the transformation of loved one to caregiver, over the period of about a year as we were writing the book, um, one of the things that, that you talk about and wrote about is what you call living between scripts. And can you describe a little bit about what you meant by that and how that dynamic works? Sure. You know, um, so I think the Academy Awards were last night. So many people winning some official awards for their scripts and they take on a role. And so in that sense, we can really identify with that. Someone takes on a role in a play, in a movie, in some fictional experience. But this term scripts also works in daily life. We all embody particular roles that we inherit in most circumstances. So as a mother or father or a sibling or a, a, a parent, a friend, these all come with them implicit types of scripts that help inform us and guide us in terms of how we're to act, but more importantly, what we should expect they help us manage the uncertainty of everyday life. If we didn't have these scripts, Donna, we would have to relearn something anew every time. And it would really make it difficult for us to work amidst the multitude of scripts that we have. So when someone is a loved one, so you and I, our book is really designed for people who are, well, you can call a variety of different names, but informal caregivers, meaning not necessarily reducible to medical professionals. We are people who have pre-existing relationships. We love someone and therefore we are called into care born out of that love that goes well beyond that in so many ways. And so the script of a loved one is remarkably different than the script of a caregiver. And the care component 
the caregiving that comes from the love that we have as a spouse or as a partner, as a child, as a parent, is in sometimes in opposition or in tension with the script of our previous relational expectation. And this is what makes it so very challenging because you may not look as if you are changing when you are caring for your son, you're, you're still a mother. But in that process of the care component, you are radically changing. And there is this disorientation. This is kind of a metaphor we use, Donna, throughout the book that I think it really spoke to us because it's like the world becomes upside down. But when you're in the midst of incredible vertigo, it's not that people can necessarily see it. It's an, it's an inside out view. It's not an outside in view. And so in that process, when we're talking about transformation, we're talking about the transformation that no one talks about. A lot of people talk about the transformation of before and after they show you know, weight loss or uh, from rags to riches or from some kind of like aspirant transformation. We're talking about a transformation that is so difficult because it is one that seemingly goes on without others noticing. And in the process, you have to rework your script. And it is a constant process because if you only stay with your script of loved one, it becomes unworkable, untenable, and actually works against you at some point. At the same time, you don't want to give up the script because you don't cease being a spouse or a loved one. But you take on this component, this additional script that is kind of supplanted on top that provides you a different look, way of looking that requires you to act and behave and anticipate in ways that you were never called on to be in your pre-existing loved, loved one relationship. And it's when these things two come together and they contest, they trespass on each other, they counteract with each, one another. This is what we're talking about. This revision of script that is almost a lifelong process as much as it is anything else. Yeah. You know, um, there's so much going on in the chat and I can't even keep up with it. Uh, and many people are, I think, resonating um, with what you're saying, Zachary, lots of people are identifying with it very strongly. And, you know, as you're talking about the script, like, I think we can all imagine, um, caring, we're all caregivers here. So we can all imagine, um, the, the kind of conversations that we would have had prior to, uh, the onset of caregiving with somebody. Usually you have a long history with the person you're caring for and you develop ways in, of um, falling into roles, power, relationships, um, all of these pre-existing dynamics that lead, as you say, to certain scripts. This is the way I talk to my mom. This is the way I talk to my dad. And um, then when care introduces itself um i think a big part of what we need to do is maintain or try to maintain um the original scripts but they don't fit they don't fit and you know dignity and the protection of dignity and the protection of the past is so important to people. And yet it feels like we're failing all the time. And I remember reading a caregiver, and I've said this in the webinar series before, because I, I think it's such an extraordinary observation. Somebody wrote, a very wise caregiver wrote, that she was propping up the perfect fake independence of her mother until she fell and broke her hip last Friday, you know, at which point harsh truths are revealed. It's like the moment of the death diagnosis with your mom. At some point, it all falls apart. All of our previous scripts blow up and, you know, they are no longer viable. So we have to figure out how to make new scripts. And 
Zachary, you talk so eloquently in our book about masks that we put on in order to achieve something, some new script. So we're not even aware that we do this, but we do it. So tell us about the masks. Yeah, the mask is something we talk about to help us understand that, you know, while we put on masks, others put masks on us. And as there are as much as cultural byproducts as they are of our own creation. And caregivers over time deter, you know, like any mask, we have go-tos that we lean on more than others. And some fit snugly and nice at some point, and then maybe become smothering at other times. Um, so much so that, you know, a sweater in the winter. Uh, a cashmere sweater makes a lot of sense in the winter. In the summer in the South, it is suffocating. Same material, but it, it can be very different depending on the circumstances. So well, let's just go through a couple of these masks that maybe some, some listening might be able to identify with. And the Saint mask, Donna, is one that we talk about, right? And this is this is almost more like the, the generic mask that others probably prop up as much as we just play the role and are kind of drawn into it. But, you know, I can't believe, Donna, that you're caring for blank. I cannot believe you're doing that. You are stronger than I am. I wouldn't be able to do what you're doing because I I, I'm too emotional. You, you just must be stronger than I am. Hmm. I just don't know how you do it, Donna. And while we take the accolades, and maybe in the beginning, you know, we might push back a little bit, but over time, caregivers are remote, remarkably socially adept to maintain their own energy levels, and they're not going to fight at every conversation. So over time, you might just accept it because you feel like it's better just not to have to try to dissuade someone of something that they don't want to believe. Yeah, it takes so, too much energy, oh, right? It's oh. a waste of energy. It, it's a waste of energy. It's it it it, it it's complicates it. And in the course of a day, you may not have that emotional energy. So um, you oftentimes find yourself um, people. Imagine this: while people are giving you those accolades when you are wearing or they put on the saint mask, they are also putting you on a pedestal. And on the pedestal, you're farther and farther back, and they're looking farther and farther up. And over time us as caregivers might feel like people are looking at us, that, that we are more observed rather than listened to. It's hard to understand a saint, isn't it, Donna? Saints are seemingly perfect. They become less and less human and more and more deity-like over time. While a compliment, it's not one that you approach. No, I mean, I think it's also um, a way of other people distancing themselves yes. from you um, because you're being dehumanized. Yes. And, you know, this idea that, oh, I could never do what you do. Uh, there's a, th that's a wall between yes. um, the caregiver and the rest of uh, society, yes. right? So there's, it's very, it's a lonely place, like you said, Zachary. Um, dehumanizing can take, you know, most of the time we think dehumanizing means that it's a negative thing, but you can dehumanize someone by being overly positive about what they're doing. And one that irks me, and I, I imagine, you know, we've, we've talked about it often, but I care too much to do what you're doing. I mean, talk about an offense to a caregiver. You know, there is no retort to that because it just takes it. And I, when you envision this, I always think about people silently taking steps backward as they're giving you compliments. It is they're almost exiting the door as they are giving you these honorifics. And that to me exactly. is the saint mask. Exactly. So there are other masks yeah. too. You and I talked a lot about the warrior mask. Yeah. The, the warrior mask is one in which, um, you know, the hypervigilance that comes with of being a caregiver in which your role in part is to anticipate worst case scenarios at every turn. And we talk about this as one of the parts of the transformation from loved one to caregiver is that you see, you have to pay attention to what isn't happening in order to be able to address possibilities in ways that others are able to get out of the moment. They're able to let go. They're able to go on vacation. They're able to drive away without fears. The warrior mask is one that reminds us that we are never away from our caregiving situation. And it is so challenging because we take that way of thinking and the kinds of thoughts that are so necessary to being with our loved one, to caring for them, and makes it writ large. It's a mask that's really hard for us to take off. That hypervigilance that is seemingly necessary, 
also is overwhelming and almost in endlessly taxing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, Zachary, we had questions that came in from um, the registrants before um, uh, before the webinar began, and quite a few of the questions had to do with, and you know, thinking about the the warrior. Um, how do people take a break to recharge without feeling guilty when they are being hyper vigilant in the role. It is an it, <laughs> it's such an important question because I think it comes from such an astute point that it's almost paradoxical. It is seemingly impossible, but we also realize how vital it is. This is a role that is a 24 hour, seven days a week. The world outside of, of this webinar today talks about vacations. The world outside of this webinar talks about the ability to predict what's going to happen. And so they're planning a vacation three months down to the day. Donna, we know, our listener, your, your listeners here know that that's not possible in the same way. Because we are living in a world of contingency. We are living in a world in which we recognize the fragility of life and how difficult it is to do that. Most others live in this kind of fictional belief that, Today is as it was yesterday and it will be tomorrow. So once we break through that and we realize that, you know, the world is remarkably fragile and all I have to do is recognize the ups and downs of my loved one in the course of one day to realize that. So it comes from a real place, this sense that how do I take a break? How do I find some opportunity for renewal? And it comes, I think, two things. One, we must have a support system where we're able to talk through these things with people who are in the midst of caregiving. So it's 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 built on this idea that we must rework our social support system. While your family and friends are vital, and I am in no way asking you to replace your family and friends as incredible social support, in order to be able to get to the point where you can allow yourself or give yourself permission to be able to be kind to yourself, and step mentally at least out of your role for a minute, 10 minutes, an hour. You must be around others who can also help you understand why that's important and who have given themselves permission to do it likewise. It's really hard going back to your social support system. And this is why caregiving is a socially disorienting experience because you thought your friends and family who have been with you all of your life experiences would be the ones who would be most helpful during this caregiving time. And they might, but unless they understand the dynamics of what you're engaged in, you're asking someone who cannot help you understand self-compassion and self-kindness. And that is an awareness that others too go in similar situations as we do. And we it's hard to get that when you go back to the people in your social support system who may have made all the sense in the world prior to the caregiving experience. So mm -hmm. one is remaking, re-adding, en enlarging your social support network, and then being with people who can help you understand that you can, you can get some control of your circumstances, not by laughing at your circumstances, but being able to talk real about what's happening. Because Don, if we're only using and leaning on audiences who feel sorry for us or treat us as saints, there is a sympathy framework that they're imposing on us that doesn't get to the real, doesn't get to the idea that we must be able to laugh and to commiserate and to be real about what's happening. That is the birthplace of self-kindness. Self-kindness can't be handed to you. No, no, it can't. I, you know, the other element that strikes me to this um, question of being able <clears throat> to give yourself permission to mentally step away, mentally take a break without feeling um you know, a sense that you are in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing. Um, I think that trust mm -hmm. is a huge issue here. It's very difficult to trust other people to 
to be able to take over the caregiving role. I mean, yeah. um, one of the chapters in our book is uh, that I wrote um, is about care mapping. Yeah. And um, uh, in terms of um, care mapping uh, in drawing your ecosystem of care of who's who and what's who is doing what, um, in your in your immediate family, your extended family, all the clinical health pr professionals that are in the picture. One of the questions, the prompt questions for reflection on a care map is, is there anybody here who could take over if something happened to me, the caregiver? And, you know, I think it, it is interesting um when if a care, if a care, caregivers are never supposed to be sick but if caregivers become ill or disabled themselves um it is uh interesting to to talk to people who have gone through this and say who did step in to your role how did you feel about it how did you learn to trust other people when you have been doing it by yourself for a long time. And um, I remember th this is another transformation. As people go through an illness, aging process, uh, a progression, our roles constantly change. And so there, there is transformation happening all the time. Yeah. And I'm reminded when our son, after 23 years of caring for him at home in a ICU kind of setting, 24 hour awake nursing care, um, he moved into a medical group home. And I thought, I thought I had no idea how to live. And I, I had to understand that as a caregiver, my role was changing, but I didn't know how to be in a new role. I didn't understand what was expected of me. Yeah. I didn't understand how to come to grips with the feelings um, of anxiety that he wasn't in the next room to check on, but also who am I as a mother? Who are we as a family now? We're broken up. You know, and I felt the same way with my mom when she moved into assisted living too. Even though we weren't living together, she had her own apartment. But I thought, oh my gosh, if something happens to me, I can't go home to my mom because she's in assisted living. I mean, here I was an adult woman, middle-aged, even now I'm a senior she died in 2018. And these were the thoughts in my head, like a little girl thoughts. Oh my gosh. You know, I think we cannot underestimate um, how we, how compassionate we need to be with mm -hmm. ourselves because these are hard okay. things we're going through. I mean, it's, it's so well said and I love your examples. I will encourage in terms of a practical act that someone can do. I encourage everyone here to do this. It sounds silly, Donna, but we've encouraged it before. Write down and make explicit what you think your roles are. And start with loved one. You know, what's my role as a loved one? And then what's my, what's my role as a caregiver? And see which ones overlap and which ones might be a little bit incompatible. If you write it down, it gets it out of your head and you can see it. What happens too often is that these are competing and antagonizing each other. And it leads to this endless sense of guilt and never enough mentality that you, you just feel exhausted from the idea that you can never meet this impossible standard. But once you put them on paper, it doesn't mean it solves the, the dilemmas. But what you can start doing is, do I need to revise that? Circle one or two items that you might need to revise, not the core components that hold, that brings you closer to your loved one. Hang on to that one. And likewise, what you need to do with your, in your caregiving role, we can't get rid of those. 
But what are the expectations that go with some of those role denotations that you might begin to tweak and to modify and come up with a rationale for it? Because you have to be able to explain that to yourself. There's no one that can change the roles for you. There's no one out there who's going to do that kind of work. And it, like we talk about, this is kind of the meaning work of like waiting for someone to tell you, give you a new role articulation isn't going to happen. You've got to find sustenance and meaning and value in the everyday to the best of your ability. Or you get stuck in this kind of vicious cycle of being harder on yourself than anyone could ever understand because they don't have access to the thousand points of expectations that you have about yourself in any given moment of your relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the questions, Zachary, that, that came in relates directly to this. And um, someone asked, uh, in caring for a spouse, how do I reclaim my role as wife when all of my caregiving is um, makes me feel like a nurse and not a wife? How, where, how can I be a wife at all? anymore. And I, I, you know, this is something that we, we talked about too. And I wonder, I mean, the same question I could ask you, Zachary, how could you be a son with your mom? I mean, it's such a profound question. I so appreciate that. And we really do go after this in the book in terms of this is an inevitable kind of experience. And so for the first, first thing I would say is that this is this is norming. I mean, like this, this isn't unusual to you, the asker of the question. Well, it, it, we, it's, so, it's so common, Donna, that we, we named it, right? We call it relational confusion. Mm -hmm. And it is what happens when two relational scripts kind of go at each other and blur together in ways that makes it difficult to understand who we are. In fact, we have a whole chapter talking about how is it that I can be lost in this caregiving role when I love my, the person I'm caring for like no other. But you can find yourself getting lost because you no longer know who you are as the question that you posed. If you are a spouse and you are caring for your partner and you are bathing daily or engaging in physical acts that once had some meaning of intimacy and now the requirements, the functionality of care are, are, are transforming that meaning to something radically different, mm -hmm. you of course feel more like a nurse than you do a spouse. And so this, there is no clear kind of like, I mean, there's no prescription here for everyone because everyone has different kinds of levels of tolerance and what that means to them. I think recognizing it is important and carving out territory of meaning that is important to you and is sacred. If it is at all possible for some of those acts to be um, either treated differently and or to have others engage in those instead of you, if you need to maintain the sacredness of your spousal role and that physical intimacy, if that is not possible, which we know it may not be for many here today, it is reclaiming or recharging a new way of achieving intimacy. So I, I transform it from the physical intimacy part to the kind of interpersonal intimacy. Um, with my mother, I, I, I was incredible friendship with my mother, you know, throughout our lives. And so one of the difficulties for me, how do I be a son when uh, she is diminishing in, in her physical capacities, even her cognitive capacities, and that sense of kind of uh, oneness that I felt with her was diminishing. And so we, I just created a ritual with her or alongside her in which um, we had our coffee in the morning and we called it coffee, 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 because that's still, she could not remember much other than that kind of iteration of it. And it was something we looked forward to at night. I would say, I'll see you in the morning for coffee. And then it was something that, that kind of moved us throughout the day. I got to look forward to something. Of course, her ability to partake in that, Donna, shaped, it changed over time. At first, she was able to participate in that. Then she was just there. But I stayed with the ritual because it was important for me amidst all of the other things going on to be able to maintain the sacredness of just sharing space and time with her where I could be a son and live in the shadow of kind of that sense of connection and oneness. We weren't disclosing verbally. That was not possible for her, but it was a sacred space of silence that we got to focus. I got to focus on 
what was present rather than what was missing or what was not happening. And so I encourage you to think about how to charge your experiences with meaning that have value for you. And each of us have those different relational value moments that remind us of who we are with that person. And at the same time, Donna, those things can sustain us. Yeah, they can. And it can be as small as a daily cup of coffee together, even if your mother is unable to drink it, even if your mother is asleep or um, so diminished by her illness that she is not responsive, you still had that coffee. It's meaningful to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I have two more questions, Zachary, and they're big questions. So I hope we, we're not going to run out of time. My first question for you is, um, you know, you and I have talked a lot about how caregiving in its isolating circumstances, in its life or death um, environment and context uh, really focuses our values. <laughs> what we care about changes. Um, and it becomes really pared down to the basics often. But this also makes us incredibly intolerant of other people. I think that's a common, maybe not everybody here can relate to this, but I think you and I know that uh, other people, if they don't understand us and they wildly um, miss uh, construe what it is that we're experiencing, even though we can't express it properly, we get really annoyed with people. Yes. And you, your anger can go from zero to 150 with the cashier at the pharmacy really quickly, or even with a best friend um, who just doesn't get it and says the wrong thing. So how should we feel or how can we interpret our own emotions when this is something that's going on that we don't understand? It's such a great question because um, well, oftentimes we just see a symptom, you know, we see our frustration or our contempt over a period of time. You know, we do develop a certain levels of intolerances for the very beliefs and ways of being in the world that we once inhabited. But we forget that we have set sail on some journey that makes us so much different now than where we were. But it's hard for us to know that until sometimes I think the points of anger or frustration, Donna, could be points of insight for us. They can help us. I mean, we can get caught up in that we're, at, we're mad at that moment or mad at that person, and, and that can be very real. But it also might be an indication that we have changed and what we value has changed. You're right in the sense that there's so much talk about what we do as caregivers. And I think I'm proud of this in our book, Donna. You and I talk a lot about the values that are shaping us and the values that we take on that keep us in this role and are shaping us in ways that we should be able to articulate affirmatively. It's so hard to do though. So when you're living in other people's worlds, there's a sense of frustration. You're having to bend yourself to the way that others make sense of the world. You know, Their belief in certainty, their in, in, intolerable patience for all things like, oh, tomorrow, the next day, we don't have to talk about it now. You know, caregivers don't have time for that. They, you should talk about something important now because you have no guarantee of the next day. Um, our intolerance for people's unwieldy belief that they they can change any situation. Yeah. Caregivers are resilient, but it, we don't we don't believe that it, our experiences tell us that there are constraints and we must live within those. Or given the givens, as you eloquently always tell me, Donna, mm -hmm. um, that. Those schisms, those those differences, should I, I would, there's a vista there, and and I want I, I challenge us to think about what we see, who are we becoming, what does that reveal about our values, what have we learned, or gleaned, or become in this process? Don't wait until you're you know like you can be one month into the caregiving role or 22 years into the caregiving role, it is shaping us. We have something that we see the world differently. We know how to be with others in ways that others do not. 
If you can articulate those, identify those, write them down, that's your reminder of what and who you're becoming. That's not living in other people's world about, I'm so sorry, I'm, it's so tragic what's happening to you. If there's a, what, we're, what we're doing and who we're becoming is more than tragedy. It, we have to find meaning in this that sustains us so that we can remind ourselves that we are becoming something in this process. And that's, you know, you can do that in a, a values-based resume. You can go to our book to look about how, like a sample of how to do that in terms of, we're not talking about a resume of like what you've accomplished. No, we're value-based. That, that's, it, it's, there's the people gathered together on this, on this webinar, Donna, we know, see the world in ways that others do not know how to connect with people, know how to create in the midst of most challenging of circumstances. So I'm not trying to make the scenario something that it's not, but I do believe that we must have some affirmative value so we don't live in other people's traps about what our life is in terms of what we're getting from it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, which is why I think that we can find so much strength and solace within the caregiving community. And looking at the chat, there's so much generosity and wow. um and knowledge and skill sharing um and and commiserating with yeah. deep understanding uh that's going on here in this community. Um so you know, like you you often say, Zachary, sometimes we don't get what we need from the people who were closest to us before caregiving. Um, and we, we, you know, there are many people who believe that with, you know, enough love and will and prayer or whatever, you can change the outcome. Uh, and we know that there are, there are bad things that happen to good people mm -hmm. and that are out of our control. We do the best we can to comfort to give um, deep comfort uh, to the people we love. But we can't stop aging. We yeah. can't stop a disease progress that has its own agenda. And I think this understanding of what we can and cannot control is something that we have in common in the caregiving community. Um, Zachary, my last question before we have to end the webinar. Um, it's gone all too quickly. Is um, there are people in the chat who have lost loved ones and they are struggling to find purpose in their lives. Do you have any um, thoughts and ideas about what happens after caregiving? What is that final transformation? Um, how can we take a caregiving experience and repurpose it for a life after caregiving? And where is the hope in that? Wow, such a wonderful question. And one that's often overlooked because, you know, from the outside world, the first question you'll get when your caregiving supposedly ends is, now you can begin your life. Now, now that's over. Now you can focus on what's important to you. Now you can do you. You can go back, right? Yes. I say that. And it's so wrong. Oh, we call that kind of shrapnel of, you know, it, it's the shrapnel of good faith, of, of good intentions. It it stings, it hurts, it 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 goes at the very heart of who we are because and, and that's a signal. That feeling of being harmed by that re realize helps us realize that. There's so much more than we can ever explain to too many people about what has happened what, and what we've seen and what and how it shaped us. And so um, the markers of culture will tell us that your care and the way you think about your loved one and what you have done ends with the moment that the acts of care end. But we know that's not the case. We know that we have been reshaped in this process. And so um, be mindful of the return to the places you worked or the friends you still have but haven't reconnected with. They may they may not meet you where you now are. 
And so in addition to those incredible friends and networks and places of being that you inhabited before, um, find and be with those who you still resonate with. So many caregiver groups online and in person don't have this kind of denotation of you have to be actively caring for someone. It, it, it is a sense that you are um, a part of a community of caring for people. That knows no boundaries. And that is an incredible kind of badge of honor that I would encourage you, uh, the people gathered today, to think about how you can take, so what happens is you have this laser focus and then all of a sudden it, it, it kind of, you don't know what to do with the great editor that was your caregiving experience that shaped every decision you made in terms of what, how were you, when you were going to get up or when you had to get up or every course of day, give time to the fact that the ambiguity you face will create doubt in what you're doing and who you are, but please be patient with yourself because it does take time to rethink and rewrite who you are and what and how you want to go in the process because be around others who are supportive and understanding of the nuances of your care and how the caregiving experience shaped you. It was about your loved one, but it was also about what happened to you in that process. When someone only wants to focus exclusively on your loved one while there's time and place for that, it's also about you. Mm, absolutely. And um, you know, just to go back to the original uh, comment that I made about reading your blog about graduation, um, you know, caregiving is a bit like a PhD in a way. Um, and, and the passing of a loved one is a graduation of some kind. It is um, a, a demonstration that um, and a, the passing, it's it's over the Rubicon. You ha can now look back on the value of your contribution, which I believe is a civic contribution yes. as well as a personal one. But I also want to, I, I, I want to reflect too, um, very quickly, uh, just on the words of, um, Arthur Kleinman, who is an author and a professor of medical anthropology at Harvard, who wrote a book about caring for his wife. It's a wonderful book called The Soul of Care. And he observes that after his wife died, he realized that his new job was to keep her memory alive. That was his new role as caregiver. He was still caring for her after she died, by keeping her memory alive in many ways, in their family, in writing this book, in um, journaling about her, intentionally remembering her and sharing those memories. It's another way of caring. So Zachary, um, I want to, to thank you enormously for today. It's just been, as it always is, such a very rich conversation. I know that many people in the chat and in the Q&A have asked for sources of support. And uh, I will be going through the, the chat. We're going to keep it. We're going to keep all of the questions that came in. I will go through those questions one by one and answer them and offer those sources of support for everyone who was with us today. And you will get that document um, with your uh, email along with a link to the recording of our webinar today. So Zachary, thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure. And back to you, Christine. Thank you, Donna and Dr. White. Sorry, my having some uh, AV issues there. Thank you to everyone. While wow, there was so much, so much um, sharing in the chat. So thank you, everyone. And one of the reasons we we love these webinars is that people can exchange. The one thing I am, um, you know, really getting the impression of, both from the talk and from the uh, comments in the chat, is the isolation people feel. And so this is an opportunity for people to share and sort of feel validation that you're not the like 
so many people say, no, I'm so glad I'm not the only one. I, I feel this way. So thank you to everyone for sharing. I will let you all know that we will be having another uh, Caregiving Essentials talk on April 8th. And we're very excited to have uh, Laura Tamlin Watts, who has who is releasing a book at the end of April. Um, it is entitled, uh, Let's Talk About Aging Parents. Uh, so for those of you who are maybe aging parents and you want to invite your children to watch this, um, that might be an opportunity to start conversations because that's something that you know we always talk about is conversations are a great way to sort of get down to the fear, overcome that fear, and, and just talk it out. So we will be sending that. I think Jen's going to put that link in to the um, into the chat. And there we have it up on the screen for you. So if you have a smartphone, you can scan that and that will take you to the registration. And I think that is about it. So, um, oh, one thing I do want to say is lots of people are saying, oh, I'm just buying your book. Okay, no one buy the book. Donna and I will pick after this presentation ends, Donna and I will pick the winners. And then I will send out an email like in the next couple of hours to the 10 people asking for their address. So if you get a an email in the next two hours saying you're a lucky winner, don't buy the book. And for everyone else, like wait until 3 p.m. If you don't hear get an email from, from Christine, then you know that you weren't a lucky winner. And then you can go buy the book yourself. <laughs> So I don't want you to buy a book or and then buy the book and give it to another caregiver. <laughs> oh, you could <laughs> good fun, Jonah. <laughs> or you could do that too. <laughs> anyway, I do want to I do want um because so many people are excited about the book. So I, I will send that email out. Donna, I'll contact you right after the webinar so we can we can do that. Uh April 8th. Oh, yes, is the day of the eclipse. Someone, um, Elena, just said, that's right. So if you are in the path of totality, which Hamilton is, I don't think you are Donna in Ottawa. Uh, I think Kingston might be, but Toronto is not, interestingly. So everyone from Toronto will be coming to Hamilton and to Niagara Falls. So yes, you can, you can watch the webinar from noon to one, and then you can watch the eclipse because the eclipse will happen, I think, around three o'clock is uh, totality. I think from two to about 3.30. And yes, it is being recorded and you will get a link to this talk and to all the other talks too in the Caregiving Essentials webinar series. So with that, thank you, Dr. White, from joining us from North Carolina. Uh, and Donna, thank you for joining us. Jennifer, who's on the back end, thank you for answering all the questions. And Jenna, my colleague, is the one who is the IT genius who is sending this all to you. Without Jenna, you'd probably be staring at a at a blank screen. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for those who joined us. And I look forward to seeing you or at least your names in the chat next time in April. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Incredible opportunity. Thank you.